For those of you who don't know me, my name is Brooke Goldstein. I serve as the director of the Lawfare Project, which is a legal think tank that's dedicated not only to monitoring and exposing the phenomenon of lawfare, but also to legally combating it. Lawfare is a term of art. It is used to denote the use of the law as a weapon of war to, amongst other things, silence and punish anyone who is brave enough to speak openly and critically about real issues of national security and public concern, such as militant Islam, Islamist terrorism, and their sources of financing. We are extremely fortunate to have Elizabeth Savadich Wolf here with us today, who, and I hate to use this term, but is herself a victim of lawfare. She was sued for her speech about Islam. And unfortunately, in Europe, where they have no First Amendment protections, they still have blasphemy laws on the books, and they also have hate, hate speech laws, which, in our opinion, are completely incompatible with notions of freedom and liberal democracy, because what does a hate speech law do? It criminalizes speech after the fact. You never know what you're going to say is going to be found offensive. And if somebody's feelings are hurt, they will then go and sue you. And the chilling effect is enormous. It's completely impossible to measure how many people have decided not to go and exercise their inalienable human right to speak publicly about issues of national security out of fear of being sued, out of fear of being called an Islamophobe. And there have been way, way too many cases in Europe that are similar to Miss Wolf's. For example, in 2002, the Wall Street Journal Europe was actually sued by the Saudi Al Rahajdi Bank merely for reporting on the fact that the bank had, had accounts that were being used to funnel money to Saudi Arabian uh, terror front organizations, some of them being used to fund Al Qaeda. We have the Dutch politician Gert Wilders, who was sued for his film Fitna, a 10-minute short film which is comprised almost entirely of quotes directly from the Quran and scenes of imams preaching death to the Jews, death to the infidels. And it was one of those very imams who sued Gert Wilders. Now, he won after several years and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, defending his free speech rights. But can you imagine the implications? A democratically elected official is sued for speaking to his constituents about issues of national security. And he had to spend thousands and thousands of dollars defending himself in a court of law. And last year, an Australian appellate, appellate court upheld the conviction of Elizabeth for, quote, denigrating the religious beliefs of Muslims merely for just giving a seminar about the life of Muhammad and referencing the very well-known and recorded fact in the Quran itself that he had married what we would consider an underaged girl. And even satire and parody of Islamist terrorism is now being silenced in Europe. Not many people know this, but a couple of years ago, the Council of Europe actually enacted a resolution that condemned Islamophobia and called on EU member states to enact legislation that criminalizes any speech that is deemed Islamophobic. What does that mean? We don't even know what the definition of Islamophobia is. And so what has happened? It's created this self-censorship. We have, for example, uh, Australian National University, which has decided voluntarily to adhere to Sharia uh, blasphemy codes actually threatened two weeks ago to expel the entire editorial board of its student newspaper, Waroni, unless they retracted a cartoon that they published that made fun of Islam. Now note, the cartoon was the fifth in a series of, of cartoons that parodied first Christianity, Judaism, Scientology, Mormonism, and Islam was the fifth. And the chancellor of the university actually said that the first four did not violate university principles, but merely because a student complained about the cartoon that made fun of Islam, that one violated uh, the university principles and the students were threatened with expulsion if they did not take it down. We have, for example, 
uh, the Dutch police who actually arrested the cartoonist, uh, and I, I don't know if I can pronounce this correctly, Gregorius Neckshot for making cartoons that parried Islamist terrorism. And of course, we all know of Kurt Vestergaard, who did the now infamous cartoon of Mohammed with a bomb in his turban, and he was actually physically attacked. Was he attacked with a knife, was it? An ax. Somebody came after him with an ax. So make no mistake about it, we have a serious problem in Europe. But also, don't be fooled, despite the fact that we have the First Amendment protections here in the U.S. Constitution, we are still seeing an enormous amount of frivolous and malicious lawsuits that are filed against anyone who is brave enough to blog, to speak, to write about militant Islam. Such was the case, for example, with Congressman, former Congressman Cass Ballinger, who testified to the FBI about CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, a fundraising arm for Hezbollah. He called them CARE as an unindicted co-conspirator in a Hamas funding trial. CARE turned around and sued the congressman for reporting to the FBI about them. And obviously, the judge dropped the case because the congressman was speaking uh, in his capacity as a public official. We have, for example, Hassan Dayal Aslam, an Iranian-American who fled Iran because he was being persecuted there, who decided to write a blog about Nayak, the National Iranian-American Council, and Trita Parsi, who you'll often see legitimized as some sort of uh, representative of the Iranian-American community on CNN, for example. They have him on uh, quite a lot. Now, when Hassan called Nayak a pro-Iranian lobby group, which is what they are, they turned around and sued him for defamation. He recently won his case after five years of litigating. Five years of litigating. Hassan Dayal Islam won his case. The judge threw, said there was absolutely no basis upon which Nayak can prove that what Hassan said was libelous. And the judge awarded Hassan $183,000 worth of punitive damages. We have the Islamic Society of Boston, for example. The mosque slash community center, who is funded by Saudi Arabia, the Wahhabi country of Saudi Arabia, where the two Boston bombers attended and they were allegedly radicalized there. We also have a radical preacher at ISB who's been caught on tape making very insightful statements and we have I think it's about 17 trustees of the ISB who have been connected to criminal activity one of them connected to Al-Qaeda and when Fox News affiliate the local Boston Fox News affiliate the Boston Herald and about 15 other people started writing articles about ISB back in 2005 to expose it ISB turned around and sued them for defamation now curiously Right after the discovery process started, ISB dropped the case. Because what happens during the discovery process? You get to discover the financial records of the organization that you accused of being funded by Saudi Arabia, and you get to prove the truth of what you're asserting. And there was also the case, and I want to mention this because it also involves care, of the Islamic uh, Circle of North America, or ICNA, when Joe Kaufman, an American activist, staged a totally peaceful, lawful 10-person protest against ICNA outside a Six Flags park in Texas. And he accused ICNA of being uh, connected to Hamas and Hezbollah, both designated terrorist organizations. ICNA didn't turn around and sue Joe Kaufman. But seven Dallas area Islamist organizations who were linked to the Council of American Islamic Relations, whom Joe Kaufman had never ever mentioned, they sued Kaufman for libel. And of course, that case was thrown out because there was lack of any standing. So where is this all coming from? Where is the push to criminalize anything deemed Islamophobic? Where is the push to file lawsuits against people who are speaking publicly about these threats? Where is it coming from? I'll give you one guess. And those of you who know me know the answer to this. So where is this coming from? One guess. The United Nations. The wonderful organization of the United Nations has every year over the past 13 years through the Human Rights Council passed a resolution that attempts to outlaw the blasphemy of Islam as a crime in international law. 
Now, did you know that there is no UN General Assembly resolution that even condemns or defines terrorism? There is no UN General Assembly or Security Council resolution or Human Rights Council resolution that condemns suicide bombing as a crime against humanity. But there are 13, at least 13 resolutions, Human Rights Council resolutions, that condemn the criticism of religion and attempt to make it a crime under international law. Some of those resolutions actually mention Islam specifically. They've been passed every year, pushed by the OIC, the Organization of the Islamic Cooperation, which is a 57-member voting bloc at the UN that has hijacked the General Assembly and pushed for these defamation of religion resolutions. One of the most recent resolutions, Human Rights Council Resolution 719, actually condemns thinking thoughts. It says, ideas that are xenophobic are a violation of international law. If you think anything that might be offensive to Islam, this is a violation of international law. Human, apparently, according to the uh, Human Rights Council resolution, HRC Resolution 1618 <coughs> condemns the use of the media to condemn religion. Now, who do you think co-sponsored this resolution, HRC 1618? It was co-sponsored by Egypt's Morsi government and the Obama administration. This past December, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton had a three-day closed-door meeting with the head of the OIC. No media were allowed to come. After which she came out and announced the application of HRC 1618 within the United States. Following which the words Islam and Jihad have been redacted from all DHS counterterrorism training manuals. FBI officials who have been with the FBI for years have been fired because they're being deemed Islamophobic. And of course, who is working with the U.S. government to pinpoint what's Islamophobic? Groups like ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America, which is a Muslim Brotherhood front, and of course, CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. Not only that, we have Fort Hood, for example, that gets classified as workplace violence. You know, the first congressional report on Fort Hood failed to mention the words Islam and Jihad, failed to mention the fact that Major Nidal Hassan screamed Allahu Akbar before he opened fire, failed to mention the fact that Major Nidal Hassan had communications and ties with Islamist jihadis abroad, and also failed to mention the fact that Major Nidal Hassan submitted an essay to the army arguing for the painful liquidation of non Muslims. All of these going to the motive, but since this was workplace violence, it was completely irrelevant. And the greatest victims of this reclassification of the terminology is obviously the victims' families themselves who then could not recover under the terrorism victim statute. And of course, we then have Benghazi, where the President of the United States, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and our new national security advisor, who is a former uh, UN ambassador to the United Nations, Susan Rice, all point their finger at one American citizen and accuse his exercise of free speech as the but-for cause of murder happening 3,000 miles away, which we found out two weeks after was a complete lie. So ladies and gentlemen, do we have a problem? Do we have a problem? I think we do. I think we have a real imminent threat to free speech that's emanating not only from the filing of lawsuits, but it's aided by loopholes in legislation where even our own government is complicit. So what is the Lawfare Project doing about it? Well, besides hosting events like these, and the reason why we do this is because we feel the best way to fight back against threats to free speech is to exercise your free speech, to exercise your constitutional rights to speak about these. So we're extremely privileged to have Elizabeth here today to exercise her free speech and to tell her story. But what else is being done? Well, we run a program called ANGEL, Attorneys and Academics for International and National Justice Under Law. We have almost 300 attorneys who have dedicated themselves to working pro bono or at reduced rates on counter lawfare cases. And the Lawfare Project uh, helps out with providing free legal research support to reduce the burden on the attorneys. And we also fundraise to help with the litigation costs for anyone who is sued. We also perform libel review. If you are a journalist, if you're a blogger, if you want to know 
uh, uh, what your First Amendment rights are. We will review your articles prior to pu publication totally for free and will help you identify anything that could be potentially defamatory. We also have our book, our first book, Lawfare, The War Against Free Speech. It's a guide uh, on the First Amendment. It's a must read for anybody who is engaging in public debate about these issues that are controversial. You do not have to go to law school to understand it. It's, in fact, it was written for anyone who didn't go to law school, and it's a step-by-step -step handbook. So without further delay, I'd like to welcome Elizabeth Sabadich wolf to the podium. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here today to discuss the ominous and growing threat to free speech in Europe, the United States, and the rest of the Western world. But first, thank you, Brooke, and thanks to the Lawfare Project, which has been a leader in both defining what lawfare <coughs> is and in building networks of lawyers, academics, and opinion leaders worldwide to prevent, as Brooke has written, the abuse of Western laws and, the judi and judicial systems, the negative manipulation of international and national human rights laws to accomplish purposes other than or contrary to those for which they were originally enacted. I must also take this opportunity to recommend Brooke, Brooke Goldstein's book, Lawfare, The War on Free Speech, which she has mentioned before, which is a practical and deeply knowledgeable book handbook for writers and defenders of free expression. I intend to distribute copies of this foundational work to selected participants, good and bad, at the next OSCE meeting this fall to empower my colleagues and, of course, to push back against those who would silence free speech across the globe. If lawfare denotes the use of the law as a weapon of war, the work of the Lawfare Project leads in defining freedom's counter-offensive. Which brings me to the topic at hand. I've just recently learned that the audience for my talk may be larger than I had previously thought. In addition to listeners gathered here in New York City, my words may be recorded by the NSA and digitally stored in a huge database, all part of the struggle against terror and violent extremism for both words we don't really have a legal definition for. Since the Lawfare Project is a nonprofit organization, the IRS may also be listening in just to make sure that what I say here is compatible with your tax exempt status. If my words ever happen to be passed through the social media, the person who posts them may be subject to criminal penalties. Yes, that's why U.S. Attorney Bill Killian went to Manchester, Tennessee a couple of weeks ago. He claimed to discuss using federal civil rights laws to punish those who make critical remarks about Islam. However, it never materialized because media attention has brought it to, uh, was brought to the event, causing public outrage. Such is the current sorry condition of free speech in the United States of America. If it's that bad here, what must be condition what must be what must conditions be like? elsewhere. This nation used to be a beacon of liberty, the shining city on a hill that, that inspired the entire world. What has happened to it? I can tell you from my own experience that Europe has slid even farther down the slippery road to tyranny. We too live under constant surveillance by our own governments. The security <coughs> services in Britain and Sweden are entitled by law to record and store all forms of electronic communications, <coughs> telephone, text messaging, internet usage, and so on. But Europe has gone beyond mere surveillance. Member states of the European Union have implemented what is commonly known as the framework decision, which is a directive that requires all countries to pass laws that criminalize public incitement to hatred against a group, and listen to this, this is a very lengthy de uh, explanation and definition, but it's worth listening to. Inciting hatred against a group defined by reference to race, color, religion, descent, or national or ethnic origin. This directive came into force in November 2010 and is binding on all states that signed the Lisbon Treaty. So as you can see, 
we Europeans don't have any fundamental law that protects us as, the first, uh, as your First Amendment protects you. Our fundamental laws, which are created by unaccountable bureaucrats in Brussels, actually give license to the state to pro persecute us. We have no protection from state repression if we choose to criticize Islam. <coughs> Most countries in Europe, including my own country, Austria, have been gung-ho to implement the EU's diktat. So many people have, har have been harassed, detained, arrested, prosecuted, and convicted for criticizing Islam that it would be impossible for me to mention them all. To read a full list, even if it were possible to compl compile one, would take several hours at least. But let me give you a pre brief representative sample of Europeans who have been persecuted by their governments for their opinions on Islamization. First, from Britain. We have Stephen Yaxley Lennon, also known as Tommy Robinson, the founder and leader of the Islam critical movement, the English Defense League. He has been tried repeatedly on various contrived charges and convicted on some of them. Late last year, he spent several months in solitary confinement before he even made his first appearance in court. From Denmark, we have Lars Hedegaard, a well-known journalist and historian. He was tried for describing in a private conversation the tendency for Muslim men to rape their underage female relatives. He was acquitted by a lower court, uh, and then the prosecutor appealed the case to a higher court, which then overturned the acquittal and fined the defendant 5,000 kroner. He appealed the decision once more to the Danish Supreme Court, which overturned the conviction once again. From Finland, Finland we have Jussi Hala Aho, a journalist and local politician. He was tried for giving examples in his blog about immigrants that were now illegal to say. He was convicted, fined, and lost his appeals to all higher courts. He also lost his position within his party, the True Finns. We're not done yet. From France, we have Philippe Val, the editor of the satirical magazine called Charlie Hebdo. He was sued by a Muslim group for publishing the Danish, Danish cartoons, the Danish Muhammad cartoons. He was acquitted in court, but you all know what it must have been what, what it must have cost to acquit him in court. From Germany, we have a hero, and I know him very well. His name is Michael Stürzenberger. He's from Bavaria. He was tried for using a photo of Heinrich Himmler as an analogy with Islam. He was acquitted, but the prosecutor is currently appealing the verdict to a higher court. And last but not least, we have from the Netherlands, you all know Gerd Wilders the leader of what may now be the most popular party in the country. He was put on trial not once, but twice, for expressing his opinions on Islam. After a lengthy and expensive court process, he was acquitted on both, uh, in both cases. From Sweden, we have Carl P. Halslow, a local politician. He posted a campaign placard of Mohammed and his wife, Aisha, with the caption, he is 53 and she is 9. Is this the kind of wedding you want to see here? He was charged with incitement against an ethnic group, tried and eventually acquitted. From Switzerland, we have a gentleman called Avi Lipkin, also known as Victor Mordecai. He was tried and convicted of inciting hatred or discrimination against a group or a group of persons on the grounds of their race, ethnic origin, or religion. His crime was committed during a discussion about the upcoming referendum on the minaret ban, when he read verses from the Quran requiring Muslims to hate Christians and Jews. He was convicted. Ladies and gentlemen, that was an alphabetical list. But as you might have noticed, I left out one country, Austria, because that case is mine. Fascist totalitarianism has returned to my country. This time it does not come with the ring of jack boots on the cobblestones. No one's door is battered down in the middle of the night. No cattle cars haul innocent victims away to an unknown destination. 
This is a soft kind of totalitarianism. It wears a business suit, smiles, and speaks in reasonable tones in the name of diversity and tolerance. The victims this time are the natives of Austria, who are being deliberately replaced with a violent, barbaric, alien culture. I am one of those victims. For a number of years, I've been giving educational seminars on Islam, sponsored by the Austrian Freedom Party. They are designated to educate the public, the people, about the realities of Islam. I learned those realities firsthand. I have lived in Iran, in Kuwait, in Libya. As a little girl in Tehran, back in the late 1970s, I watched the beginnings of Khomeini's revolution. I was held hostage in Kuwait when Saddam Hussein invaded in 1990. And I watched the people dance for joy in the streets of Tripoli, Libya on 9-11. My experiences made me want to understand what lay behind all the ghastliness I had experienced. So I spent a lot of time researching Islam and then began teaching others about what I had learned. I told them that Islam did not respect free speech, or other human rights for that matter, and was particularly brutal in its treatment of women. I explained that these characteristics derive directly from the totalitarian Islamic doctrines. In Islam, brutal repression is not a bug, it's a feature. My seminars became more popular, drawing larger audience and uh, drawing a larger audience. As a result, they drew the attention of the multicultural left, which is very influential in Viennese politics. On two separate occasions in the fall of 2009, a leftist magazine called News sent an undercover reporter, a young girl, a journalist, blonde hair, very friendly. She was sent as an undercover reporter to secretly tape my lecture. They then turned over the tapes to turned the tapes over to the authorities and filed a complaint against me for my so-called hate speech. In October of 2009, I learned that I was under judicial investigation only through a news magazine before I ever received any notice from court. Neither did my lawyer, by the way. For almost a year, the investigation proceeded. Then in October of 2010, I was informed of my indictment and impending trial. Once again, not by the authorities, not by my lawyer, I was informed by reading it in the news magazine. No official notification whatsoever. The trial then began in November of the same year and continued until the following February. The case eventually focused on my description of a phone conversation with my sister, in which I referred to Muhammad's sexual relationship with Aisha, his child bride. My sister wa was appalled at the thought that I, might be uh, that I might call Muhammad a pedophile. I said, what else would you call a man who has a thing for little girls? This statement was what the court chose to highlight, along with various other hostile remarks about Islam. However, it became obvious partway through the trial that it would not be possible to use these things to convict me under the charge that had been laid, which was incitement to hatred. As a result, on the second day of the trial, and this is something that is uh, special in Austria, you don't have it here in the United States, at, on the second day of the trial, the judge at her own discretion added another charge, a second charge. And then it became clear that I would be convicted on whatever ha would happen. And the charge was called denigration of religious beliefs of a legally recognized religion. When the verdict was handed down in February of 2011, I was acquitted on the first charge. By the way, I was the first one ever in Austria to be acquitted uh, of the charge uh, hate, uh, incitement against hatred. But I was convicted on the second, and I was fined. It was very clear that the judge was determined to find a charge under which I could be convicted. The convoluted logic, and listen to this, for her decision was the following. It was not factually correct to say that Muhammad was a pedophile, because although he had sex with a nine-year-old, 
he remained married to her until she was of age. That is, he proved that he only liked girls part of the time, so he couldn't have been a pedophile. <laughs> I know that sounds like a passage from a dystopian fantasy by Philip K. Dick, but it's not. It really happened. I was there. It happened in a court of law in the city of Vienna, in the country of Austria, in the year of our Lord, 2011. The reality of modern multicultural Europe has merged with dystopian fantasy. As Humpty Dumpty says, said to Alice, when I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we have stepped through the looking glass into a strange new world. I appealed my conviction to the highest court in Austria, but lost. My final hope is the European Court of Human Rights, but that, that is a very lengthy <laughs> and expensive process. My case is currently pending, and the final chapter of my story has yet to be written. What I find interesting is that the story about Aisha was central in my case, just as it was in the case of Karl Herslow in Sweden. Mr. Herslow and I pointed out the same thing, that a middle-aged man should marry a little girl who plays with dolls is an abomination. We remind our fellow countrymen that this is something that all right-minded people find appalling. Our descriptions are, of the issue are entirely based on facts. There is no need for us to embroider the truth. It is laid out very clearly in authentic hadith or sayings and teachings of the Prophet Muhammad by the most authoritative schol Islamic scholars. Muslims believe that Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old, and they also believe that Muhammad is the perfect man to be emulated by all pious Muslims. This is why even today, Muslim men routinely marry nine-year-old girls, often much younger ones. Karl Herslow and I simply felt that this story is one that the Western world should be told. We never deviated from the truth. We never exaggerated the story or added false material to it. We told it like it was. Yet doing so is, den is denigrating, denigrating the religious beliefs of a legally recognized religion and incitement against an ethnic group. How can this be? How can telling the simple truth about what Islamic scripture says insult that religion? In order to understand, we need to take a brief look at Islamic law or Sharia. In particular, we need to know what Islam means by slander. To a Muslim, the word means something totally different than it does to you and me. When we think, of, we think of slander as a malicious lie told with the intent to harm another person. But this isn't what Islamic law means when it, when it mentions the word slander. One of the best sources, and that's what we need to do, we need to go to the Islamic sources. One of the best sources on a Sunni Islamic law is an authoritative m manual known as the Reliance of the Traveler. In chapter R, holding one's tongue. We learn that slander means, and I quote here, to mention of your brother that which he would dislike. End of quote. Further on, we are told, and uh, this is a lengthy quote, so please bear with me because it's a very important quote in this context. We are told further, in fact, tail-bearing is not limited to that, but rather consists of revealing anything whose disclosure is resented. The reality of tail-bearing lies in divulging a secret, in revealing something confidential whose disclosure is resented. A person should not speak of anything he notices about people besides that which benefits a Muslim. Now you know the definition of slander. That is, if you say anything that is resented by a Muslim or does not benefit him, then you have slandered him under Sharia law. It doesn't matter whether you, what you say is true or false, but only whether it makes Muslims look bad. 
Muslims are quite aware they look bad whenever the story of Muhammad and Aisha is told to non-Muslims. This is one of Islam's dirty little secrets that must be never told, that must never be told to infidels. We are all infidels. Its telling is resented by Muslims. Therefore, those who tell it have slandered Islam. And under Sharia law, guess what the penalty is for slandering? Death. This is the justification behind those infamous signs that say death to those who insult the prophet of Islam. I'm sure you've seen those big signs. If you haven't, go online, uh, Google them, uh, London. They've been, they, they were shown in London and Brussels, Amsterdam. Now we understand why my words, despite their truth, are considered slanderous by Islam. But the big question here is, why is an Austrian court enforcing Islamic law? Why does the court find it appropriate to apply the Islamic definition of slander in a case against an Austrian citizen? As I mentioned earlier, the same interpretation was attempted in the case against Karl Herslow in Sweden, who, un who fortunately escaped conviction. Similar cases are popping up all over Europe, in Australia, in Canada, and even in the United States. If you run afoul of Islamic slander, truth is no defense. As my uh, attorney said, we could have had Aisha and Muhammad sit right next to us. It wouldn't have made any difference at all. The only consideration is whether what you said harms Muslims. President Barack Hussein Obama made it clear that the same interpretation of the, world of the word slander is to be applied on from now in the United States of America when he said the future does not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam. By now it has become obvious that we are in the midst of a widespread systematic and determined attempt by our political leaders to impose the Islamic law of slander against a hitherto free people. Why is that? From Sydney to Helsinki, from Los Angeles to Vienna, the de facto imposition of Islamic law is underway. The right of free citizens to utter not just their opinions, but the truth itself is being denied. Why is the same thing happening throughout the West at the same time? The answer, in a nutshell, is this. The infiltration of the political establishment by Al-Ikhwan Al-Muslimin, better known as the Muslim Brotherhood. The Brotherhood has been working assiduously since the 1970s to place members of its affiliated organizations in state, federal, and local government here in the United States and within important transnational bodies and NGOs in the European Union. They have worked patiently and carefully for 40 years, keeping their eyes on the long term. It is through their efforts that jihad and Islam were removed from the lexicon of the FBI training manuals. They are the ones who made the term Islamophobia mainstream, caused the UN and the EU to equate religion and race, and convinced the European Union to designate cr criticism of Islam as a hate crime. The persuasive power of tolerance, anti-racism, and diversity, combined with the lure of petrodollars from the Gulf, have suborned our public officials, both here in the United States and in Europe. We have reached a point where our elected officials, media people, and academics believe that the right of free speech does not apply to those who say bad things about Islam, not even when those things are true. And they even believe that this is the enlightened liberal position to take. Pushing back against the Muslim Brotherhood's agenda is very tough to do. It will be a long, difficult slog. Overco overcoming decades of indoctrination will require something close to deprogramming. The fear of being called a racist has been drilled into the entire populace for many years by the promoters of multiculturalism. The Muslim Brotherhood shrewdly transformed Islam into a race for legal purposes, thereby turning critics of Islam into racists. 
As a result, the man in the street experiences an almost instinctive aversion to saying or thinking anything about Islam that is not bland, positive, and nice. Countering this entrenched reaction requires a patient, objective program to make people aware of the facts behind the Islamic drive for expansion. This drive is inherent in Islam. It is laid out clearly in the Quran and the Hadith, and it is mandatory for all faithful Muslims. The Islamization of Europe, Canada, Australia, and the United States is a direct application of the core teachings and legal code of Islam. The most exhaustive material on Islamic doctrine and Sharia may be found in the briefings of Army Major uh, Stephen, U.S. Army Major Stephen Coughlin. To start the ball rolling, presentations based on Major Coughlin's work might be given in places such as the Lawfare Project. You can talk to Brooke uh, to learn more about where to find Stephen Coughlin's material online. But the question remains how to publicize such presentations. And that is the hard part. That's because the media, in general, will not give our effort an honest treatment. I know, believe me, been there. Those of us who have become prominent in this line of work have learned that fair coverage of what we do is un almost unheard of. As a result, we need to publicize our educational efforts by word of mouth and through the alternative media. Local news outlets are more likely to report honestly than major national news, ma major national networks. Talk radio, social media, Twitter, and Facebook, web forums, these are all ways to propagate useful information widely. Yes, that means everything you say will also be known by NSA, the CIA, the FBI, and the, all the other alphabet soup or federal government agency, agencies. But there's simply nothing we can do about that. What we, sta what we say here today is still quite legal, for now anyway. Until Bill Killian reaches his goal of removing First Amendment protections from the criticism of Islam, our right to say these things is guaranteed by the United States Constitution. I'm not so lucky. I don't have such a guarantee in Austria. Danes, Britons, and Swedes, and Germans also lack protection. But you, as Americans, you still have the privilege of the First Amendment. It is time to use that privilege now, while you still can. The free speech movement depends on people like you. We cannot expect our leaders or our media to preserve our freedoms. It's up to us. I'll close with a quote from a well-known Swedish Samizdat writer who writes under the pseudonym of Julia Caesar. Mm -hmm. She has dedicated her life and her writings to exposing what has been done to her country without the consent of its people. In a recent essay called We Changed Our Lives, she, says, she writes the following. We knew that no human being and no political system building their existence on lies could last forever. We knew the truth always wins. We knew that the truth can break through quickly. We knew that the truth can take a long time and sometimes breaks through with violence. We knew that the truth had been replaced with new systems of lies. We used to think about the orchestra playing on board the sinking Titanic. We thought that the musicians perhaps felt a little better than those who ran around on deck in a state of panic. And we had no choice for that matter. We simple, simply could not manage to watch our country going down. Ladies and gentlemen, we have no choice. And time is short. The ship is sinking, and it's closing, before it's sinking, it closes in on the iceberg while the orchestra plays the dancers glide across the floor under the party lights. It's not just Sweden that's going down, or the United States, or Austria. The entire, the entire Western world is steaming full speed ahead towards that iceberg. Silence, ladies and gentlemen, is not an option. Nothing will keep me silent. I am adamant that my daughter and my daughter's daughter shall never live as Islamic chattel. 
It is our responsibility, the responsibility of all of us, to do what we can now while change is still possible. What Elizabeth reminded me of was the greatest irony. You know, Europe has a very troubled history, as we know. Europe has the history of the Holocaust. It has this, the history of a, a very fascist, far-right movement that committed atrocities. And the greatest irony is that it was the Jewish community that lobbied in the most part to have hate speech laws enacted in Europe and to criminalize what were anti-Semitic cartoons. And yet, we didn't heed the advice of, of Voltaire. We didn't heed the advice of John Stuart Mill or John Locke or all the luminaries of free speech that we learned in day one in law school, that free speech is a double-edged sword. And as the Supreme Court said, even the most offensive speech has to be given the highest level of protection. Because once you start criminalizing speech that's offensive to all, eventually it's going to cast a very wide net and start criminalizing legitimate speech. And that's what we mean by the slippery slope and free speech being a double-edged sword. And also, finally, the greatest irony is that the majority of victims of Islamist terrorism are Muslims. There are people like Malala, who got shot, a 14-year-old girl in Pakistan who got shot in the back of the head for saying that girls have a right to education. They are the thousands and thousands of children who are being recruited by Al-Qaeda, by the Taliban, to become child suicide bombers and to serve as human shields. They're the people in Pakistan every day there's a suicide bombing in Pakistan. And yet those of us who are talking about these issues, we get called Islamophobic. And it's gotten so bad that in the UK there was a, a, sex, a sex rape gang, a gang, a, a grooming, a gang. grooming gang. And they would take these children, they would target white female children, and they would repeatedly rape them. And the police in, in the UK, and the Midlands police, knew about this for over five years. And they didn't do anything because, because they said on the stand recently, when they were finally convicted, these guys, when they were being, sorry, the case is ongoing, they said on the stand when, when they were being um, interviewed as witnesses that they were afraid of being called Islamophobic if they did anything about this. So the greatest victims of the silencing of free speech or is the Muslim community themselves. What we're seeing right now is despite, despite the laws on the book that make it a crime to denigrate the religious beliefs of others, we are seeing a rise in anti-Semitism in Europe. We're seeing the, the BDS movement is flourishing in Europe right now. And what we're seeing is what I mentioned before is the same laws that were lobbied for by the Jewish community, ironically being used against those in the pro-Israel community who are talking about imminent national security threats to the Jewish community and to the Western world at large. So that's, I mean, I encourage you to read some of the Supreme Court decisions, like Terminello, for example, where the court said famously, even the most offensive speech must be given and afforded the highest protection. And there's a reason behind that. And this is why we have these events, to have these types of conversations, to bring these issues into the public dialogue, to have these debates. So I thank everyone who participated today, and we hope to see you again soon. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.